Welcome back to the podcast. I am your ever-suffering Professor Hamby, here with the also-ever-suffering T.A. Rowan. Say hello, Rowan. Hello. So, did you enjoy the holidays here at Miskatonic? As much as you can. As much as you can. Well, I I think it was your first time experiencing our New Year's rites here, where we build the Wicker Man and sacrifice a freshman. I don't think you got selected, did you? Last I checked, I'm still here. For, for those unfamiliar with the tradition, it goes back to the pagan tribes that inhabited the Miskatonic territory. And we no longer actually, of course, sacrifice a freshman. There's a little bit of, you know, throwing of pig's blood and that kind of thing. You know, it's a good, hearty Christian tradition. Pagan Christian. That's eh, just fun. Who cares? Right? Sure. Well, I'd hope to do some more upgrades for the podcast, but it turns out that's not going to be possible, budgetarily speaking. Turns out that the dollars contributed to Miskatonic to pay for our various upgrades were given in Tanzanian dollars. To which I said, well, that's not so bad. The Australian dollar is only a little bit less. And they looked at me and said, no, Tanzanian. I didn't know Tanzania had its own currency. That's slightly problematic. In fact, according to everything I can find, they don't. So, I, I'm slightly concerned that this is a form of monetary exchange that's handled based on, I don't know, Tanzanian devil pelts or something? Anyway, fortunately... I have security doors on the office, so nobody's reclaiming the equipment. That's good. Yep. And today, we are going to continue talking about Sandman. We are going to discuss the story, A Game of You, which is featured here on the cover of Volume 3 of Sandman, the Deluxe Edition, which we're using as our point of reference in the class. Now, before we get into that, a little bit of news. It's been pretty quiet over the holidays in the publishing sector, but as the United States House of Representatives was uh, sworn in, the new members of the House, there was a little bit of a hubbub, hubbaloo on Twitter as somebody took a picture of a table containing materials that people were being sworn in on, and there was a replica copy of Action Comics number one. Now. For those who don't know, traditionally in the United States House of Representatives, people are sworn in on a copy of the Bible. However, we live in this thing called modern times. Some of our country is still trying to get used to the idea. But in these modern times, not everyone is Christian. <gasps> I know, it's shocking. Shocking, I say. So, some are sworn in now on Quran or the Torah. Sorry, my brain shut down there for a second. Uh, some atheistically inclined members do their sworn oath on a copy of the United States Constitution, and the story quickly spread that somebody was going to swear in on this copy of Action Comics number one. This is, of course, not true. Now, even if somebody had had the sense of snark to do this, for which I would applaud, by the way. Yes. Although I think you could find something better than Action Comics number one to use. Mm -hmm. In fact, what they were doing, we have not found out who it was. Uh, apparently, the staffer who took the photo and posted it did not want to project the image that they're letting private things out. But it turns out that sometimes, underneath whatever they're swearing on, they may have something of personal significance. And one of the members was swearing in on the Constitution and had this replica copy of Action Comics number one and some other personal family mementos underneath it. Mm. Still, I thought it was an interesting story. So let's jump into a game of you. Now, all of the chapters or issues of this arc have titles taken from songs, some great songs, and this is often described as the least popular Sandman arc. Oh, why? I actually don't know, because it is my favorite Stan Sandman arc. Oh. 
I think that he is very tight as a storyteller, he being Neil Gaiman, in this arc, more so than most. A lot of Sandman, although very entertaining and some of it thematically interesting, suffers, frankly, from being this hybrid thing of an ongoing serial that needs to invest people in this wide arc that they weren't sure how long it was going to go, and then trying to have some real storytelling meat behind it mm. as it goes. And I think he really hit his stride and did his best job here in a game of you. However, apparently my tastes are not shared universally, as many other people think it's weak and dull and boring. Eh, we'll let you make up your own minds. Hmm? Happens. It happens. This particular arc is dedicated to Jonathan Carroll and Tori Amos. Who? Who's Tori Amos? Yes. Tori Amos is a singer-songwriter. She became quite famous in the 90s and had several big hits. Uh, she is a piano player, oh. but made pop music. Oh. And I think is a quite talented musician. That's cool. And she had a reference in one of her early pop hits where she made a reference to hanging out with Neil in the Dream King. That, mm -hmm. That's clever. And she still makes music to this day. Mm. And although she's not a huge pop-selling artist anymore, I still look forward to her albums. And some of her best music is now being produced when she's no longer a pop star, but still has a loyal following. I feel like a lot of people from the 90s still do music. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, pop music comes and goes, but if you're an artist, you just keep making music. And the fact that popular tastes don't always align with what you're doing shouldn't matter as an artist. Yeah. Well, when you're making music, you're not doing it for money. <laughs> right. A lot of them never become pop stars to begin with. But it is very different from other fields like writing. As a novelist, if you make it big as a novelist and you write two or three good novels, your fans are going to stick with you for life. Yeah. However, if you do two or three big pop albums... You can then just disappear and be relatively obscure again. Music comes and goes. Right. It's very fickle in that regard. And maybe it also is a reflection on the fact that, just to be blunt, less people read than listen to music. It's true, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So as we open a game of you... Oh, it, uh, I'm going to back up a second. As we open a game of you, I'm going to mention that we're going to have some callbacks to earlier stories here. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to go all the way back to the diner and Preludes and Nocturnes for some of this. <gasps> as well as some of a doll's house. Or sorry, doll's house. Intentionally separate from the uh, Ibsen play, A Doll's House. And a character is returning from that. In fact, I think that the themes of Ibsen's A Doll's House, which were touched very lightly upon in... Gaiman's Doll's House come front and center and are the core themes here in A Game of You. Specifically themes about identity, but those identities of being, uh, of those themes of identity and the role of a woman in a male-dominated world, both are absolutely front and center in this story. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see people analyze Neil Gaiman now and call him a woke writer when he wrote this decades before the term woke came into use for social uh, consciousness mm -hmm. of personal identity issues and such. Uh, in that sense, Gaiman has been woke from the very beginning and has always been a woke writer. I still hate the word woke. I, I know, but it is a useful identifier, even if crude and ambiguous. So we open a game of you on the land. It's frozen and white, and we get text boxes in different colors representing different people speaking, although we don't get to see those people. And they're talking about the princess. Will he find the princess? What are they going to do? And these names and elements are thrown out that sound absolutely fantastic. You know, like Colonel Knowledge. The Tentulablin. They talk about forests. 
we immediately are set in this vibe that there's some sort of fantasy world going on here, and there's a challenge. They're struggling. They're hungry. They're miserable. They're concerned about failure. What's going to happen? And they fade off into darkness, and then we see a blonde woman laying disheveled on her bed. And it says, New York, Slaughter on Fifth Avenue. Which is a song reference. Mm. Now, just viewing this, can you guess who this character is? Is it Barbie from Doll's House? You are correct. It is Barbie. Barbie is back. Doesn't look quite like the Barbie we saw before, though. Mm -hmm. Barbie before was this perfect middle American blonde, coiffed, ready to present the idealized version of the 20-something blonde girl next door. Now her hair is crazy. She's laying on a bed with her arm draped off the bed on the floor. We see on the wall behind her various posters, including one of a nipple piercing. Mm -hmm. There's a buzz at her door. She gets up disheveled and goes, after she cracks the door open, Wanda, I was asleep. And as she opens the door, we see a clearly feminine figure with very masculine features. Mm -hmm. And it is a figure that's kind of taking the place of the drag queen from Doll's House. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Wanda. And Wanda is not a drag queen, but is a transsexual, a man transitioning to woman. And fills, in a lot of ways, the same role that Carter did back in Doll's House. Mm -hmm. So she and Barbie are talking. They talk about making coffee, what to do for the day. Barbie wants coffee before they go out. So Wanda heads out to find cream for the coffee, which is a great literary way of giving the writer an excuse to introduce the other people living in the house. Mm -hmm. She first runs into Thessaly, who... Looks like a mousy, bespectacled, brown-haired girl carrying books. We find out she's supposed to be an art student. Then she wanders over to an apartment with a very butch dyke. Mm -hmm. And is asking for cream. And we meet Foxglove. Mm. Now, Foxglove we both have and have not met before. Mm. Foxglove is the short-haired, sort of spiky-haired blonde. Mm -hmm. And when we last heard of her, she had a different name. Mm. When the girl in the diner in Preludes and Nocturnes was trying to contact her girlfriend, that was Foxglove. Oh, yeah! She has now moved on, changed her name to Foxglove, and, of course, we have this element of Rose connecting them, who is not present here. But Rose is still the center, I guess. <laughs> well, she connects to these figures, yeah. but Rose, it turns out, the events of Doll's House do follow up into a game of you. Mm -hmm. But they both do and don't. It's complicated. It's complicated. Neil now, Gaiman, go figure. Right. <laughs> so she gets the cream in a little frog mug. She goes down the stairs and runs into some real nasty guy named George who glares at her, mm. who just screams in cell. Yeah. And we catch back up with Barbie, who is now drawing a checkerboard pattern over half of her face. Hmm. So we see the strong split from the Barbie of Doll's House. Uh -huh. Barbie was a doll in the Doll's House. Uh -huh. In some ways, everyone was, but especially... Honestly, her and Ken. Her, Ken, and the drag queen. Mm -hmm. But in a way, the weird spider sisters and others too. Yeah. Everyone was a doll in some way. And here we see this figure who's going to go out window shopping with Wanda with this extraordinary painted half face, mm -hmm. this very Harlequin esque face. Mm -hmm. This is no longer the middle America girl next door. Mm -hmm. She has a very punk vibe. She wants to stand out. She wants to shock people and has obviously split with Ken. As she should. And we find out later in the story that after the events of Doll's House, 
everybody kind of snapped in some way. And Ken hit the point where he was going out and hooking up with women and bringing them home and having them live with them until Barbie just was done with it and left. And that ritualized leaving the doll's house. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of ways, she's still kind of a doll. Mm -hmm. I mean, even this outrageous half-face she's doing with this checkerboard pattern is reminiscent of a harlequin, which is an established social trope, not a real person. Mm -hmm. A harlequin is still wearing a kind of mask, mm -hmm. which is kind of turning a person into a stereotype, into an idea, mm -hmm. right? Right. Then we switch to see Morpheus. Morpheus is chatting with uh, Matthew, the raven, about the business and what has to be done. And then we immediately go back to Barbie and Wanda. Mm -hmm. Now, they were talking about there's something going on in the dreaming and there's something he's going to have to deal with. But for now, Morpheus is okay kind of watching it. Out in the larger world, we run what the into... Fuck? Would you like to repeat that? What the fuck? It's a dog. I love him. Yep. He's beautiful, isn't he? Uh -huh. That is Martin Tinbones. He kind of looks like something out of Dr. Zeus. He does, doesn't he? I never thought of that. And we've seen him before. Wait, wasn't he in Barbie's dream? Right. Do you remember that way back in Doll's house... When all their dreams began colliding, we saw an image of her as Princess Barbara walking through a fantasy land with Martin Tenbones and some other odd little figures. Because mm -hmm, she had these great fantastical dreams. Mm -hmm. And as she's talking to Wanda, she says, I don't dream. And Wanda says, everybody dreams. And she says, you must just not remember your dreams. And Barbara says, Barbie says, I remember, remembered them when I had them. I used to have them every night as a child. And they were extremely vivid. And it was like following a story, like a book or a TV show. And then she basically says that during the events of Doll's House, the dreams went away. Oh, 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 no. That, that's never a good thing. No. <laughs> And now we see a figure from her dreams is here in the real world a few streets over. Now, some amusing stuff here. Mm -hmm. Wanda. I dream. I have terrific dreams. Never about sex, though. Not since I was 12 and having my first wet dream. Now, they were really Mondo weird. <laughs> I once dreamed I was making out with Weird Zoe Lila Lake. You remember the Weird Zoes? And Barbie doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, when I read this in this edition, I blinked heavily and went, what? Because I had a very clear memory of not Wanda saying weirdzos, but bizarros. Are you familiar with the bizarros in DC Comics? No, I've never heard of them. So, bizarro is a classic enemy of Superman back from the Silver Age. Oh. Basically, he's like the anti-Superman, but not evil, just acts opposite. Oh. And he's like chalky white. He lives on a planet that's a cube. There are bizarro versions of all the Superman supporting cast there. Oh, wait. They made a movie about that, didn't they? No. Hmm. But he, he may have been in some animated things. Oh, okay. But the idea was, like, for example, he destroyed things. Not because he was evil, but because he was opposite Superman. And I distinctly remember it saying Bizarro. And then, I so I went and found my actual issues. Mm -hmm. And found it does say Bizarro. While here it says Weirdzos. So I did some research. Interesting tidbit. So Neil Gaiman has said that he didn't think there'd be an issue with him using Bizarro in here. Because they weren't reestablished after Crisis on Infinite Earths. And he didn't think there would be a chance of any kind of conflict. But apparently this was at the point where Karen Berger was trying to move the Vertigo titles that were big, especially Sandman, because it was the biggest, mm -hmm. away from the superhero DC universe. So they had somebody, after this was lettered, in the office, literally taking tape, 
taping Weirdzo over where it said Bizarro. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just imagining some like old disabled man who doesn't get paid enough right. at like 2 a.m. doing this. Right. For time. Right. Which could well be the guy who took the fall for one of the original starters of DC Comics because he got employed for life after going to jail for him. It might have been that guy. Yeah. It's a weird world, isn't it? But it fell off. It went to the printers and it fell off and stayed bizarro in the original printings. So when they did later reprints such as these, they went in and digitally changed it to Weirdzo. I feel so bad for that tape person. Which I'd been completely unaware of until now. But uh, but it amused the heck out of me. <laughs> now, as this goes, Martin Tinbones has absolutely terrified people. Trigger warning here. Violence towards giant fantasy dog. And the police end up shooting him dead. Oh, poor because they're freaked out. Yeah, and sounds like the police are, right? Barbie arrives and immediately recognizes him. And it turns out he had brought something for her. The porpentine. You remember the jewel she was wearing in the dream? Oh, yeah. Now we see the other figures that were in her dream back in Doll's house. The bird, the monkey, the rat, and they're all standing around talking about this great crisis and how Barbie's Princess Barbara has been gone so long. Oh. Wanda and Barbie return to their apartments, Wanda basically carrying Barbie, who's still carrying that gem, the porpentine, mm. who then encounters what she thinks are hallucinatory birds in her apartment. Oh. And she figures she's losing it. How, well, yeah. However, one bird remains solid, flies out, and crawls into the neighbor George's mouth. Gross. Also, I'm just now realizing what his face reminds me of. Who does his face remind you of? It reminds me of the weird cousin character from Courage the Cowardly Dog, if you remember that episode. I do. I do. His face reminds me of that. And for those who don't know Courage the Cowardly Dog, it's probably findable on YouTube at this point. It was a cartoon from decades ago, and it was absolutely brilliant. And therefore, lasted a very short amount of time. Of course. And hilarious, in my opinion. Uh-huh. But we also see that George has a poster of Barbie in his apartment. And, of course, like all villains, he loves monologues to nobody. Of course. So out loud, in an empty apartment, he goes, You don't know us, Princess Barbara, but the children of the cuckoo know you. Oh, yes, we know all about you. Ew. Yeah. <laughs> but they did a good job with his creepiness, yeah. didn't they? Oh. So we see Barbie wake up. Uh, she talks to Hazel. Hazel's concerned about things. And she basically asks Barbie, what do you do if you think you're pregnant? And Barbie, of course, is like, um, you're a dyke. And Hazel goes, oh, great. Tell me something I don't know. Uh huh. Well, it turns out that I guess she's technically only mostly a dyke. And she had a night with a guy who was mostly gay. And they were both really drunk. Happens and she was trying to comfort him. Happens to the best of us. And she said, but we were standing up, so nothing would happen, right? No. And the American education system has striked again. Struck again, but yes. <laughs> um, so, they're having this conversation. And Hazel's like, maybe I'm not pregnant. Barbie's like, maybe you're not pregnant. And eventually they part ways. Barbie starts dreaming and f goes through a series of kind of nightmares mm -hmm. until she finally opens some curtains and runs into one of her companions. He's so cute. 
Uh, yep. There's I, I know you've never read the Narnia books, mm-hmm. but this is very Narnia, by the way. Oh. Very and they're dated in many ways, but I actually loved the Narnia books as a kid. Mm. Now they are Christian allegory. But they don't shove it in your face. And they're perfectly enjoyable without being religious. Mm. And they were written by a gentleman called C.S. Lewis, who was a close personal friend of J.R.R. Tolkien. In fact, both of them proofread each other's writing a lot. They were both members of a group in Oxford, England, called the Inklings, Mm. who uh, hung out and drank and talked about literature at a club called the Eagle and Child in Oxford. Yeah. And many of them were professors at the university there. What is it with writers being professors? Because it offers you free time. Oh. Yeah. Let me tell you, when you have an actual full-time job that's like 40 plus hours a week, it's much harder to find time to write, especially when you're mentally exhausted at the end of the day. Fair. Yeah. Now, there are a number of people who have had full-time jobs who became successful writers because they successfully found jobs that while not well-paying, allowed them to write while they worked. Like, famously, Herman Melville was a night watchman for a bridge. He had to raise the bridge up and lower it down when ships came through, but otherwise he could sit around and write. Really? Yep. This was, of course, back in the 19th century also. Oh, that explains it. Yeah. I was so confused for These days, they would just use a little GPS signaler and robots would do it. Yeah, that's what I was confused. I was, I was like... Who needs a bridge watcher? Still. Now we enter the next chapter, and George takes off his shirt and then uses an X-Acto knife to cut his chest open, where we find out his insides has no organs, just bones and darkness out of which fly birds. Ew. You're saying that a lot today. There's no other way to describe that than that looks gross. It, it is a slightly disturbing, isn't it? Poor birds. Meanwhile, we see these birds now flying to all the residents of the apartment building. And they're keeping them asleep, putting them into nightmares. Oh. We see here Wanda having a nightmare about being a man again. And we see Weirdzo Lila, number one. And that kind of stuff. We see the dreams of Hazel, who dreams of a stillborn child. And Foxglove, and her weird dreams about Judy, who died, of course, in the diner. This is where we find out that Foxglove is Judy. Or, Uh sorry, that that Foxglove is the girl that Judy was dating. I can't remember her name at the time. I can't either. Yeah. And then the bird goes to Thessaly's apartment, who wakes up, grabs it, and says, very calmly... Huh. Nasty little thing, aren't you? Then promptly beats it to death against the wall. And then summons fire and burns it to ash in her hand. What the fuck? Thessaly might not be an art student. You think? Or maybe she is. I don't know yet. Meanwhile, she gets up, puts on a coat, walks up to go see George, and as he opens the door, has a knife hidden behind her back. And now we go to Barbie back in the dreamland where her companions, Wilkinson and who's the rat and the others sort of reintroduce themselves and find out that they kind of have a quest they need to go on. Meanwhile, things are going bad for everybody. They're all waking up from their dreams Mm -hmm. because we find out George is dead. Thessaly took the knife and as soon as he opened the door, she killed him. Wasn't surprised after seeing what she did to the bird? Nope. She is a person who believes in direct action. (laughs) Clearly. At least she gets stuff done, apparently. (laughs) She does move the plot forward. We gotta give her that. Uh I think Gaiman sat down and went, I need someone who's gonna move shit forward. She's correct. (laughs) Yep. So she goes and gathers up Hazel, Foxglove, and Wanda and takes them up into George's apartment. Until somebody wants, and everything's going fine until somebody says they want to use the bathroom. And she says, you probably should go down to your apartment for that. Because I left George's dead body in the bathtub. Why is it always the bathtub? 
It's convenient. Easier to clean blood stains out of. I never thought about that. Really? I don't know why. With your love of crime stuff, you never thought about that? I don't know why. Wow. I'm sorry, I need a moment. <laughs> At least I didn't think cold water boils faster. Oh my god. <laughs> this is not a podcast for our personal stories, but I'm never getting over that. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> never. Oh, same. So we see Thessaly say, we need more information. So I'm going to get a hammer, some nails, and a bowl. Someone else who gets stuff done. Right. So she goes, cuts off George's face, and pins it to the wall, and then cuts his tongue out with her teeth and puts it back in the face that she's hung on the wall with the nails. And then summons his spirit back to talk. That's one way to have a talk with the dead. Yep. I guess Ouija boards don't work in this world. They're probably just less reliable. She wants it to go quick. <laughs> and at this point, she's just covered in blood and all this stuff. But she's figuring out what's going on, and she's pissed, and she says, Okay, we need to enter Barbie's dreams. And the only way to do that is by the moon road. We're going to have to call down the moon and get the fates to open up for us. And we need... Can you guess what she needs? This is, this is old magic stuff. What, the heart of a virgin or something? <laughs> Menstrual blood. Gross. But very much tied in paganistic, mystic traditions, especially related to feminine powers. I didn't know that. Oh, absolutely. Big time. Big time. And she said, well, we're going to have to get it from you, Foxglove. And the others go, why, why does it have to be Foxglove? And Thessaly says, well, I haven't had a menstrual cycle in thousands of years. Huh. So now we find out she's really old. She goes, Hazel's pregnant. Good to know she knows. It's really kind of rude to out her like that. But, yeah. you know, ancient witch, I guess, knows these things. Mm -hmm. To which, of course, her girlfriend's like, what? But it's like, hold on. She's got some explaining to do. We'll do this explaining later. This is not the time or place. Mystic ritual to enter a dreamland first. Explanation about how a dyke is, gay, is pregnant later by a gay man. Shit happens. Right. We got shit to deal with. And Wanda's like, well, I'll go with you. Thessaly says, you cannot. You're not a woman. To which Wanda is offended. I am a woman. And Thessaly says, you can say you're a woman all you want. To the ancient powers, you're not. This is one of those logger jams where it's like, society can say whatever it's want, it wants, but biologically speaking, you're not. It wants a biological woman. And we're going by the definitions here of these ancient magics and ancient feminine entities. Turns out ancient entities are kind of transphobic, I guess. Well, <laughs> I mean, if it's tied into magic with things like menstrual blood, yeah, I mean... Can't really do anything about that. Thessaly may not produce it now, but she used to. Mm -hmm. uh, Hazel certainly could if she wasn't pregnant. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that was never in the cards for Wanda. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. But this gets back to that idea of identity. We're dealing with these identities. So, George was this fake George who really was part of this cuckoo thing, whatever it is. At this point in the story, we don't really know. Thessaly's pretending to be an art student. She's obviously an ancient witch. Uh, Hazel is a dyke who's pregnant, which is not, not consistent with how society labels dykes. Mm -hmm. And then Wanda is choosing to be a woman, although her family, she comes from a conservative place, and society at large determines her to be a, a man. Mm -hmm. And then we have Barbie. And it turns out that really, it looks like Barbie is the f fake personality. And she's really a Princess Barbara in her heart. Mm -hmm. 
So here we have all these identities, a social identity and then a true identity, mm -hmm. which is usually much more complicated. And notice they're all women. This is why I said this is putting some of the themes of Ibsen's A Doll's House front and center. For those who aren't familiar with A Doll's House, it is about a housewife who lives her life being this perfect little housewife and finds it stifling to the point where she can't deal with it anymore and has to move out and strike out on her own to find out who she really is, away from being a doll for the men around her. Mm -hmm. It is not hard to see how those same themes are front and center here. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Thessaly is calling down the three who are one, in order to open the moon road and to the land of dreams, which they're not initially thrilled to do, but she calls on the compacts and does it, which leaves Wanda present with a sleeping Barbie and George on the wall who wants to talk because Thessaly didn't dismiss him before she left. Thanks. Thanks for leaving me alone with the creepy face nailed on the wall. Yeah, seriously. Right. Meanwhile... We see the group of adventurers in this fantasy land, the land it's called, doing a fellowship of the ring. Yeah. You know, specifically as they're being snowed upon and a storm is hitting them. This is kind of like right before the fellowship heads into Casa Doom and, you know, Gandalf does his whole thou shalt not pass with the Balrog. Mm -hmm. No Balrog here, though. Just lots of snow. But we find out in the course of all this that the threat upon the land is this entity called the Cuckoo who has taken over and killed lots of people and has evil troops that obey her. It's all very, very Narnia-esque. Mm -hmm. And as they go along, they find some secrets out and they, you know, do all this stuff. I'm not going to spoil it for readers. But we even get to see these creepy army figures pass who are clearly inhuman and don't look like they're any kind of living creature. Ew. They're just like shadows and armor with red eyes. They look really cool, though. Yeah. And so they're heading towards the Cuckoo's Castle, supposedly, to accomplish something. Meanwhile, back in the Dreaming... We see Morpheus talking to Lucian and Nuala there. Nuala, as you may remember, was the gift from the Fae oh, yeah. to Morpheus. Oh yeah, the weird, creepy human thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we find out that he assigned her to watch over Barbie as things developed. And in one of Barbie's earlier dreams, she actually took the initiative to warn Barbie. And she's afraid she's going to be punished. Okay, here is, I think, an important moment that people pass over in the series. Okay, okay. Morpheus says, I see. Thank you for telling me, Nuala. That will be all. We see him walking away, and then we see another panel of him walking even further away, but then he stops, turns around, comes back and says, Nuala, you did the right thing. That is something the old Morpheus would have never bothered to do. He praised someone? Right. Stopped himself and made himself turn around to come back and praise them. Morpheus is growing. Old Morpheus could never. Right. So we return to the land in the adventure trip with the monkey, the rat, and the parrot. And they continue through... Their adventure, talking, all this stuff happens. Then they stop for the night somewhere and wake up to find the monkey hung and dead. That's depressing. And they hear these evil, shadowed whispers from the forest. Oh, the, the, the art changed. It looks so sad and depressing now. It's now done in these dark blue tones of deep black shadows to communicate this lightless force. Before, the coloring was almost like something you could see out of a kid's book. Right. And then we return to that once they go back in the sun. But again, places like Narnia had dark, evil places. Mm -hmm. 
And in some ways, this is an homage to Narnia in this part. As the story continues, we get some dialogue between Wanda and George, which is kind of amusing. And we see that the parrot, Lulz, has left. Barbie and Wilkinson the rat are waiting for him. And then Lulz returns with what he calls friends. Those don't look like fr Oh my! And Wilkinson <gasps> dies trying to defend Barbie as Lulz the traitor has brought the soldiers to arrest her. Of course the bird is a traitor. Yep. And of course a cuckoo is a bird. And Barbie asks, are you the cuckoo? And he says, no. But I have the honor to serve her with all my heart and all my soul. And they walk through this medieval town with all these fantastic creatures and reach the cuckoo citadel. That's a pink house. A pink American house, like you might find in Florida. Specifically, it's Barbie's house that she grew up in. Dun, dun, dun. Now, this is where something important takes place. Do you know what cuckoos are famous for? No. This is shared earlier in the story. But one of the things that cuckoos are famous for is laying their eggs in other birds' nests for them to hatch them. Oh. So... Barbie goes in the house, and it is her house. The big old box CRT TV, the gaudy furniture, her dad's fishing trophy, all that kind of stuff. And then the cuckoo arrives, which is her as a child. It looks like her as a child. It has her memories of her as a child. But it's really not her. It is this entity, the cuckoo. It is living inside Barbie's dream and hatching herself there because she doesn't have a way of hatching herself. And the cuckoo here is a metaphor. It's some other kind of entity. And we find out in the course of this story that this land did not start with Barbie. She came into it as a young child dreaming and kind of inherited it and added to it. In fact, we find out that yeah. Lowell's, Martin Tenbones, Wilkinson, all of the other main characters we've seen were toys of Barbie's as a kid. Mm -hmm. She added them to the realm, but the land already existed before that. Mm -hmm. The cuckoo should have been able to hatch and leave on its own, but something happened in the events with Rose Walker when things happened in Doll's house and the land became sealed off. That's why Barbie couldn't dream anymore. Her dreaming nature was tied to it, and the cuckoo couldn't hatch and leave. Oh. So... That whole event fucked a lot of shit up. Yep. So she kind of uses some magic to put Barbie to sleep, and then says to the armored soldiers, I want her taken down to the Isle of Thorns. We start at moonrise. Meanwhile, back in New York... <laughs> Which kind of looks scarier... <laughs> It turns out that when Thessaly said she was calling the moon down, that was not a metaphor. Oh, no. So shit is getting fucked up on a planetary scale as the moon is coming down to the Earth. Could you put that back? We kind of need it where it was. But they can't because they are physically no longer in the world. They're on the moon's road headed to Barbie's dream. That's not good. Well, maybe it, 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 that it's complicated. And all of this being triggered by Thessaly dealing with that cuckoo wanting to mess with her dreams, which it never actually did. But she's willing to see the world destroyed to get her vengeance. Meanwhile, as they walk along, she finds the corpse of Wilkinson, uses blood from it to speak to his spirit. She's good at that. Yeah, necromancy seems to be her thing. right up her alley. Uh, by the way, for folks who have spent too many years being influenced by Dungeons & Dragons, using the term necromancy to mean raising skeletons and throwing necrotic bolts of energy, it actually means to divine the future from the dead. Mm. Monsi, to know or learn, necro-death, and it actually means to speak to spirits and such and divine knowledge from them. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, as they're walking, Hazel and Foxglove have a little interaction, and Foxglove is not happy with Hazel. 
If we ever get home again, I'm going to, I, I don't know, scream at you, throw things across the room. I'm going to call you names you never even knew I knew. I'm sorry. What kind of relationship did we have, for Christ's sakes? You're dumb. You know that? Dumb and selfish and deceitful and secretive and, and dumb. Fair. Do you know how much a baby's going to cost us? A lot. It's New York. For a start, we have to buy one of those dumb books full of names. Pre-internet. Oh. And they express their love for each other. I mean, Foxglove is mad, but it does not even cross her mind to split up with Hazel over this. It does not even cross her mind to say she shouldn't have the child. She's angry at her, but accepts that this is a part of their relationship dealing with the other's mistakes. And that is, in my opinion, a healthy way to look at relationships. Which is hard because you don't want to use that as an excuse for accepting abusive behavior. But there's a difference between abusive behavior and fucking up. Meanwhile, Wanda's dealing with what might literally be the end of the world... Oh, yeah, because she's the only one left at home not dreaming. Right. With the face pinned on the wall. Which, honestly, I'd be more okay with the world going to shit than having to deal with that. So maybe she wins. Yeah, it's, it's kind of messed up. <laughs> Meanwhile, back in the land, the Cuckoo and Lulz are dragging Princess Barbara down to a weird little symbol. And it's called the Isle of Thorns, the place of the Hierogram. Now, she had been told, Barbie had been told, that she had to take the porpentine, the gem, down to the Hierogram. And it turns out there had been a figure called the Hieromancer who knew all this work that had been based on Barbie's grandfather. And he understood it, but the cuckoo killed him. Because, of course. Meanwhile, the three women catch up, and the cuckoo runs out, crying for help, saying... The cuckoo is horrible, and they have Princess Barbie, and playing the whole little kid is a victim shtick. Mm -hmm. And Thessaly, of course, is like, who's the cuckoo? And, mm -hmm. well, the only other one there is the bird Lulz. Mm -hmm. So the cuckoo points out Lulz, which bird cuckoo. Mm -hmm. Although Lulz is a parrot, so... But anyway, it's good enough for Thessaly, who walks up, and immediately murders him. Well, she kind of gives me the vibes with giving an excuse to kill anything might take it. Yeah. And, and her her rationale for her rash actions are, well, she needed to be taught a lesson. No, you, you just wanted to be vengeful. Yeah. Meanwhile, because they haven't been focusing on her, the Cuckoos had an opportunity to Jedi mind wipe them, like she did Barbie. So now they're just going to stand around and not pay attention as the cuckoo destroys the land, and they will die, not having any firmament to remain on in the dreaming. Barbie stands up under the control of the cuckoo, takes the porpentine, smashes it against the stone, and giant light explodes. If you're going to take any lessons from this, folks, don't raise, don't bring the moon down. Leave it where it is. Yep. And be careful about destroying fantasy worlds when you don't have a way to survive when the world goes away. That too. So... Now in the dream world, supposedly this dream world's about to get destroyed. We don't know how yet, but somehow. Mm -hmm. But we do see the stars are starting to fall out of the sky. And meanwhile, back in the real world, we see it being destroyed by all the absolute weather chaos being created by the moon moving out of orbit. Because it turns out planets being where they are is kind of important yeah. for the whole system. And then all the stars, back in the land, all the stars fall out of the sky except for one which becomes a moat in the eye of Morpheus, who then coalesces to stand there amongst them. Who once again needs to save the day. Well, he was waiting for the destruction. Because of course he was. Because he says, I am here by the terms of the compact. Who summoned me? Who calls this scary to its final judgment? Who seeks my boon? And he reveals that he created this land. Which, of course, he did because it's a part of the dreaming. Yeah. But it turns out that it was a deal. He and somebody parted on bad terms. Because, of course. Because he goes through girlfriends a lot. Uh-huh. And they had a conflict, and as part of their resolution, he agreed to create this land for her. Hmm. And she lived there and presumably died or something happened to her. It's not clear. And she never 
called him. That was the purpose of the porpentine. Did you notice the porpentine, although a different color, looked just like his emerald dreamstone? Oh, yeah, I, I never noticed that. It was another dreamstone, and the one who held it could shape dreams within the land. So that is how, for example, uh, Barbie was able to create from her dreams of Wilkinson and Martin Tenbones and them permanent residents of the land because it was a dreamstone that worked within the land rather than the entirety of the dreaming. Which basically made it its own isolated part of the dreaming. Mm. Which could allow that dreamstone, a sort of more limited version of his, to shape the realm. And the when, by the compact, when the owner of the realm, that woman, was ready to finally go away. She was to s destroy the stone, signifying no more control, and he would come and shut down the scary. Shut down the operation. Which he's doing now. And now we see all these fantasy creatures, not just from Barbie, but from previous people controlling it, all coming down that little pathway and walking into his robes and disappearing. Ooh, it's so cool looking. And we even see Wilkinson there again. Oh, he's back. Yep. And then at the very end, a single woman in a white dress. And he says, I am here, Eleonora, by the terms of the compact. And, he a and she asks, how long has it been? And he says, a long time, old love. Your land has been home to many since your day. Oh, so that's her. Right. And it's not clear why she didn't summon for him and why she wasn't around consciously anymore, but... But shit happened. This is what's happened, yeah. And he says, now half the compact is discharged. I wonder if you three, meaning Hazel, Foxglove, and Thessaly, know the trouble you've caused. Doubt it. Thessaly just kind of looks around like, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, and he says, uh, I should say, he, sa he asks her, I know you, do I not? I, I, I don't believe so. I do. Yes, we have met before, witch woman. Uh, it was a long time ago, Dream King. I'm surprised you remember. There were more of you then. Yes, now it's only me. Why aren't you dead? Oh, look, don't you start. It's a long story and I don't want to get into it. And then she tries to claim the right to kill the cuckoo and claim her life. And Dream says no. Then she demands it. And he says... You demand? Thessalian, the moon has tumbled into the sea in this place. It cannot take you or your followers back to the waking world. You are a trespasser here without my consent. I am very displeased. What is it with people thinking they can boss around Morpheus? I don't know. It never works well for them when they're in dreams. What? Who thinks they can boss around a god? Right. So, Hazel, of course, asks, uh, what's he saying? I am saying, young lady, that you are here entirely. He's saying we're in trouble. And they are. And, in fact, back in the real world, they're not alone. We see the storm has totally shattered the apartment building, and it collapses with a homeless woman and Wanda, as well as the sleeping form of Barbie in it. So we return... And we see Barbie now in a uh, uh, restroom of some kind, starting to do something with her face and makeup. Oh. But then we flash back to the dream world. And Morpheus is asking Barbie, Princess Barbara, what she wants for her boon. She's the one who summoned the end of the realm, and she is due a boon now at this time. What does that word mean? A boon, a favor. You know, and uh, but something more significant than a f just a light favor, a big favor. Oh, okay. And Morpheus explains that the cuckoo is not truly evil. She may seem it, but she is a creature just trying to survive and existing by its rules. Now, Thessaly tells Barbara, have the boon be to kill the cuckoo, and I'll find a way to get us home. Don't worry about it. I wouldn't trust that woman as far as I can throw her. And by the way, uh, the reference Thessalian that Morpheus made, that is to a particular region of Europe. Okay. 
indicating these are she's probably part of some old paganistic witch tribe from an ancient times of the world. Anyway, Barbie does not put any faith in Thessaly, and her boon is that she wants Morpheus to send all of them home safe and sound. And he allows the cuckoo to then fly free, off to some other place, which pisses Thessaly off. Good. Now, back in the real world, they return to... Barbie finds herself buried under a bunch of stone, but is rescued, but Wanda has died. Oh, no. The others survive because they weren't physically there anyway. But Barbie is now going to Texas to the funeral for Wanda that his family is throwing, who insists on calling Wanda Alvin. Mm. The birth name. Meanwhile, there's a little, there's also a little dialogue happening between Thessaly and Morpheus. Just a little on the flirtatious side. Look, the emo boys get around. Clearly! And we see that what Barbie was drawing on her face is a veil. Mm -hmm. A cross-hatched veil. And she's wearing a black dress and pearls appropriate for going to a funeral service. Mm -hmm. And she's freaking these small town folks out with the drawing on her face, but continuing what she did in the first time, except this is different. This is no longer a mask. And this is an important form of symbolism. Before, she was drawing a half Harlequin mask. Now she's drawing a veil. But in this time, it's expressing her inner emotions, her grief. So she's no longer putting on a mask. She's now projecting and expressing herself through this drawing. Mm -hmm. Which means that she's moving past being a doll. Mm -hmm. And she's expressing her identity, mm -hmm. which is really important. There's some exposition as we learn stuff that happened afterwards. And the funeral eventually ends. The tombstone says, Alvern Robert Mann, 1966 to 1991. After everyone else leaves, Barbie sits down, takes out her lipstick and crosses over Alvin and writes Wanda on the tombstone. Aww. So this is that expression of identity again. Mm -hmm. You know, society may say you're a man. Mm -hmm. Your family may say you're a man. Mm -hmm. The old gods may even say you're a mm -hmm. man. But fuck them all. Mm -hmm. And I think that's beautiful. It is. The thematic elements of this adventure story identity, a woman's place in the world defined by society. These are real experiences mm -hmm. that people have. They've simply been cast into a fantastical form for the purpose of entertainment and literature, which is what good literature does. We do get a beautiful moment at the end, and I love this from Neil Gaiman. We see Wanda, and death is approaching her. Mm -hmm. But notice something different about Wanda here. Those masculine features are gone. Yeah. Wanda and death has become that feminine figure she always wanted to be and envisioned herself as. And that's a nice moment. And in the end, we simply see Barbie leaving. She gets on a bus and goes. And that is the last we see of Barbie in Sandman. Not even a small little uh, uh, throwaway image when the series ends. That's it. Now, it's not the last we see of some of the other figures. Actually, Foxglove becomes a major figure in two death series. Oh. And Hazel has some appearances in that. Mm -hmm. Not written by Neil Gaiman. And Thessaly has some small appearances later in Sandman and has had several spin-off miniseries of her own. Oh, wow, I'm surprised. Yeah. So what did you think of A Game of You? That was good. I enjoyed that. Where would you rank it on the Sandman stuff you have seen so far? That's like at the top. It is the top for me. Now, in the next few lecture sessions, we will discuss Ramadan, which is my single favorite ep issue of Sandman. Mm. But this is my favorite arc of Sandman. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. I don't get why people don't like that. That was good. I, I think because they didn't like, I think a lot of people don't like that it has a clear purpose and it pulls back on the fantastic adventure and big supernatural happenings to focus on these personal themes, which is actually why I like it. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I, I like that it didn't 
it didn't feel as busy as the others. And that is why I said that I felt like he really hit his stride, he being Neil Gaiman, and writing a tight, focused story here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is it. Class is no longer in session. Bye. Okay. Class is dismissed, but you are not. I have a quick info dump for you. If you want to listen to more of the podcast, we are available everywhere. We are on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, even on YouTube. Additionally, you can find me on social media, on Mastodon, Twitter, Tumblr, TikTok. I probably have a copy of the podcast on an iPod mini in a hobo's pocket in San Francisco. That's right, time travel. Do you want to know where you can find all these links? You can find them on my link tree. That is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Prof Hamby, P-R-O-F-H-A-M-B-Y. It is the comics course. And don't forget your homework.